Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show today. We're going to talk about the importance of school gardens and how they are uh, great for not just the students, but the teachers as well. As well as a bonus segment of garden questions. We're getting so many in on social media and email. We want to address them at the right time of year. And then we have guest Joel Carson. He is the creator and author of The Strawball Gardening Method. He's got some great information for you. And then we'll finish up the show with more of your garden questions. And all that starts right now. Is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, or anywhere in between, I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend, and gardening partner. Live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening, containing over 1,100 garden videos, short and long format, and everything in between, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, there's a number of ways in which you can contact us, and one is the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. The Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline is naturally, naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in any time to 414-444-5250. And you can also tweet us at TWVG Show. And or hashtag TWVG, or you can email us at TWVG show at gmail dot com. You can also text TWVG uh, or text three four five three four five to TWVG and sign up for a weekly email. You can do that on the website too. Well, we had uh, several talks this past week in which uh, we want to welcome those individuals to the program. We were at Brookfield Community Library on Tuesday evening when we talked about. Uh, growing potatoes in containers and the ground. We want to welcome those individuals. And then we were at Random Lake on Thursday talking about 10, uh, 10 gardening tips, garden solving problems. As well as I was at the Waukesha County Courthouse for the Health and Wellness Program on t- Wednesday afternoon. So I want to welcome all of you who are listening and those of you who have been with us from day one. We appreciate your support and the, um, and you listening to the program. Well, uh, we had, uh, you know, we put this program together on podcast for replay on, on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher. We do the in-studio video of the program, and we do it uh, very professionally. And uh, we had a comment come in a couple of weeks ago, and the, the comment was, way too, ma- too many commercials. And then Charles, our good friend in New York who always listens to the program, chimed in and said simply, no commercials, no show. Well, this is just like any other program that you watch on TV or radio. There's a certain amount of money that has to be brought in in order to pay for the airtime. If you listen to any podcast, any radio show, unless it's like some small, tiny podcast somebody is just putting on their little website, um, but if you listen to anything basically on like Stitcher, iTunes, there's commercials. Well, here's the thing. You guys in Milwaukee and those who are listening on the replay and live are very, very fortunate because if you listen to any other radio program that's garden-related in North America, majority of that hour program, most of these programs that are an hour long, you're only getting about 30, 28 to 32 minutes of actual garden talk time because they have 30 minutes of promos, traffic reports, news at the top of the bottom of the hour, and commercials. So we only have about 12 to 13 minutes of commercials during the hour, and we pride ourselves on that. With that being said, we're going to talk about the, the first segment here is something that we find uh, it's very important, and it's the value and importance of having school gardens, uh, having gardens at schools for children. And we reached out to an individual who we're good friends with, Mike Poblaski. Is that how I pronounce uh, it? Pavlesny. Pa- Pavlesny. He's out of New Jersey, and he does a radio podcast program uh, several times a week. And he actually wrote an article indicating the the, the, the statistics, the, the numbers on what and uh, how important it is to have school gardens. And now there is several garden schools in the Milwaukee area that have gardens, and there are schools that are across the country that are now uh, using this as part of their curriculum to teach kids the value of gardening and working together and being stewards of the earth. Uh, Earth Day is tomorrow, so that's you know one of these things that you know we want to encourage the young people to do. 
uh, we have a niece and a nephew, and they, they, I think our niece has a school garden, but we they have one a nice one in their backyard. Right, and um, they they definitely have learned from us and learned from seeing us work in the garden, and my sister helps with the garden as well. We basically help set it up for them, and they maintain it throughout the season. But they, under, they, they, they understand. understand. Yeah, uh, when it was nice nice out earlier in March, one of those days, uh, our nephew was out in the ground digging up Digging in the dirt, saying that he was, he's kind of mimicking Joey. He, uh, he said that the, the rocks were seeds and then he was pretending to make a video with his little play camera. So that, I mean, and, and a lot of kids <coughs> do not know where corn comes from or soy or, or beans. They just or, think it comes bread. from the grocery store. Right. So we've got some uh, numbers here and these are courtesy of npr.org, elementarylawncare.com, uh, bridge the gap. Uh, reach.org and uh, we're going to go over some of these numbers that are somewhat uh, interesting when it comes to uh, the benefit that gardens can have on an, on children. Right. So um, so school gardens show a 12 to 15 percent increase of students passing uh, standardized tests. So that's one. And then... Um, 94% of teachers report seeing an increase in engagement of their students. Well, let's just stop right there. Whenever children or anybody grows something, and we've seen this, the body releases, an, what is it, an endorphin uh, in the brain that has a, you know makes you feel good and that excitement of harvesting or planting or, or seeing that, that, that plant grow. Uh, so that is... A benefit. Yeah, I mean, th- a lot of times kids go to school, they sit in front of a computer, or they, you know, that most of these things are computers now. When I went to school, you had pencil and paper, and if you're listening young, ask, ask your parents what pencil and paper are. Uh, and, and that was it. It was It's repetitive. Whenever you can engage in the soil, and, and there's studies shown that when you get involved in the soil, that, that is, uh, helps you, your mind work better, and it's better for your health. Uh, right. It's, um, it's a it's different a natural, activity. Yeah. Right. It's a natural mood booster is right. what it is. And there's been studies showing that that's been proven. So um, 55% of Americans believe that gardening should be part of a school curriculum. I don't that's think 55% of Americans garden. That's, well, that's the other thing. But that's okay. Like right. They want. They think that children should learn that. Right. Yeah. And they want the children to garden for them. 73% of students who work in school gardens report an increase in their act, uh, activity uh, and, and uh, uh, produce... What is that, Holly? Um, oh, uh, they they are act their consumption of uh, produce. Yeah. So by and this and we knew we've known this for a long time. You kids who grow food eat that food that they grow. That's just kind of the the mindset. They see it grown, they see where it comes from, and they want to interact with it. Um, so that's another thing. Twenty six point six percent of U.S. public edu- uh, elementary schools that uh, have a garden program. Uh, that's up. That that they have a school program. Twenty six point six percent of elementary schools have a school program. So that's increased eleven point four percent since two thousand uh, six to two thousand seven. Yeah. So th- there are school program schools that are, are picking this up, and we do see um, a tremendous amount of benefit, not only to the health of the children, but also to this is um, yes. Go this ahead. This is a good one here. Uh, this is something that we should definitely talk about. Is because. Um, educators, fifty-eight percent of educators see the reason. Say the reason their school does not have a school garden is due to lack of funding, and that's probably a huge reason why a lot of schools don't have those gardens. Right, mm-hmm. a- and we're not, you know, on a school board, and we don't understand. You know, there's a lot of obviously we're going to be real about. It, there's a lot of politics that go into people who run schools. We get that. But also, when you see the numbers here, and these are not just not made up numbers, these are actual numbers that have been proven to be true. We do fundraise, kids do fundraisers and they sell candy and they sell wrapping paper to all, you know, all this stuff. It, to, to raise money for a school garden, I think, would be more of a, hey, would you like to help support my school garden or start a school garden? I think more people would be receptive to that than buying more wrapping paper or candy that sometimes, let's be honest, a little overpriced. And I think that if they show, if, you know, they're trying to fund a school garden through 
I don't know, a bake sale or whatever, mm-hmm. um, they could include some of these statistics, like this one where it says 60% of educators at schools with gardens say their students show a greater interest in eating healthier. And that's um, that's good because they're growing the food, they know where the food comes from, and they know that they've worked to grow those vegetables. And 91% of these schools in which have a garden, it's geared towards the pre-K and, and up through about the fifth grade. And that's really your your developmental stage of that. And then once you get, you know, fifth grade, then they can kind of take over, you know, go home and say, hey, where can we have a garden, that type of thing. They understand the fundamentals of it. Uh, we had a guest, we had guest on last year, uh, Carrie and Carrie of the Seed Keeper uh, Company. Carrie and Carol. Carol, and yes, yeah. Of uh, the Seed Keeper Company, they go around and they fund they, they support uh, school gardens and they donate their some of their products to help school gardens uh, develop and grow and store their seeds. And they told us a little story about a correctional facility. I believe it was in Idaho. Oh, Idaho. Well, I want you to share the story, Carrie, of uh, of the correctional facility, the the school. Uh, if you can share that story about the the kids that just are, were amazed by the the school gardens, if you would. Right. The Southwest Idaho Juvenile Detention Center probably is not a real happy place when kids are getting there, you know. I'd be scared if I were going to juvenile detention. Well, there's a marvelous warden, as they would call him, I guess. Really, he's like the school principal. And he said, you know what, we need to start a garden here. We need to give these kids some hope. And so they started this marvelous garden. And after the first year, they donated over a 1,000 pounds of produce to the local homeless shelter. And those kids felt great. And we just thought that was such a marvelous story, you know. In a place that might be bleak, you learn something and you walk away from that having, you know, maybe gotten, you get in touch with yourself, you get in touch with other people, you learn that you can do things, that you can have a positive impact on society. And we just think it's a very, very cool thing. And our hats go off to them. And the funny thing is we gave, we awarded them. They were one of our first years. And we got a letter back from the principal, let's call him that, and he was just so excited that we recognized their garden, and we went, you know what, You're the, we're the winners here. When people teach children how to garden, they carry it on, and they may not do it forever, but they understand it and the impact that food and plants have on our society. So that you can see, even if it's not a school, it's a correctional facility, the positive impact, giving, you know, people in life want to see a reward for what they do. And, and we see a reward when we grow a garden. We, even though it benefits us, we're not selling the produce, we're not donating anywhere. We, we get that uh, endorphin high. We get that reward going, hey, we've accomplished something. We just didn't sit in front of a TV and play a video game for 12 hours. Now, sometimes in life it's okay to do that. But when it comes to all the, the food production of it. And, and, and another statistic... 84% of teachers considered that school garden programs help uh, st- students learn better. So what comes what comes out of this is that um, not only do the kids benefit, but so do the educators as well. And that seems to be the the, the positive, is that it's not just benefiting the kids, it's benefiting the, the teachers. And it ranges from eating better, better class participation, um, positive side effects, incorporate garden studies, and then... Um, they can incorporate into existing programs such as nutrition, health, and science. T- tying it all together. Yeah, tying it all together. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I feel that it should be taught in schools. I think that would be definitely great. We've gone to a few different schools and talked about gardening, um, something that we we do enjoy doing. It's not always possible, but um, it's something that I think that should be considered. So we wanted to bring up these uh, stats to just show that there is positive reinforcement uh, or you know numbers that back up if schools do have gardens and i understand that there is the money factor the where are we going to put it the who's going to take care of it type of thing because the majority of schools are out of session during the the growing season or most of the growing season so we want to thank mike Plub- Ma- mike Pedlesny from uh, new jersey who wrote this article shared it with us so we could share it with you when we come back it's a bonus segment of Garden Questions. We're getting so many of them, we want to address them at the correct time of year so we can help you grow better. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com.
Keep your garden growing and your grass green with a Chapin G362D Professional Hose-In Sprayer. Easily fertilize your lawn and garden and control pests. Just fill the tank with solution, select the mixing ratio, attach to garden hose, and spray. One 32-ounce tank will spray up to 362 gallons of diluted concentrate. Find online or order through Lowe's Home Depot. Do it best hardware. See the full line of Chapin products at www.chapinmfg.com. The tree diaper is an advanced plant hydration system. It is an innovative device that captures and holds the water around your plants once full and hydrates them slowly when the plants need it over a period of 30 days. From half to 30 gallon capacity based on your needs. And easy to install even for a first time gardener. The tree diaper reduces weeds, protects plants, enhances root growth, and prevents overwatering. Whether you're growing trees, vegetables, flowers, house plants, in containers, or the ground, your plants will benefit greatly by allowing the tree diaper to do the work for you. Find out more at treediaper.com. Made in the USA. An Oya is an unglazed porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through drippingspringsoyas.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear in all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at zazproducts.com. Walnut trees producing toxin? This garden fun fact is sponsored by Minerti.com. Get your three-pack today. Drop the tea bag in water. Let steep, then feed your soil, not your plant. 100% organic. Find out more at Minerti.com. Always free shipping. Walnut trees produce a toxin called Gerlon. This is harmful to many other plant species. That toxin helps protect the plant's territory to ensure it gets enough sunlight. This toxin can remain in the soil years after the tree has been cut down or has died. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B-O-B-B-E-X dot C-O-M. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscaping Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Here's two gardeners that understand common sense. How effective is that, really? Well, that's about as effective as a screen door on a submarine. Joey and Holly Baird. We're always happy whenever we get a lot of questions coming in, and that's where we're sitting at. That's why we have a bonus segment of questions. If you want to call in with your question, you can certainly do that uh, on the IV Organics 3 one Plant Guard Hotline at 414 414- Four 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 fifty two fifty, and uh, we are going to address several of them here that are applicable uh, to the time frame of this uh, right now. Yeah, so uh, we got the first one here. My pepper seedlings have what looks like a salty deposit under the leaves. 
Can you tell me what that is and how to fix it? Well, this is common whenever we're tra- starting seeds indoors. You're going to pull the leaf up, and it, it's actually going to look like, you know, whitish fl- flecking paint type of thing. Uh, this is from overwatering. The leaves w- of these particular, uh, the ones that are affected, will dry up and fall off, and the plant will recover and will have no problem at all. So that's perfectly fine. Just watch how much water you're putting on your to pepper plants and, and really any plants because the overwater you're going to have uh, a lot of issues with that overwatering can have the same symptoms of underwatering and under fertilizing and over so you got to be cautious of that um so sophie asks i'm new to seed starting and my plants seem to be behind or, or shorter than others do you typically fertilize your seedlings at all before garden transplant if so with what um, and then she said she uses an organic seed starting mix, which does have some fertilizer in it. Um, yeah, if you grow, if you're growing plants that are going to take a long time to start from seed, like onions or even herbs, um, herbs things like that, you're going to have to give them a boost, especially if they're in a smaller container. They might have to even possibly be transplanted. And if you're going to use a fertilizer, you want to use a slow release fertilizer, uh, and preferably, uh, liquid fertilizer would be best get quarter strength recommended if, the, if you know whatever the recommendation is quarter strength uh, on the back of the instructions because if you add too much of this it's going to complete sometimes overpower the plant and cause problems uh, with that and you don't really want to add a granular fertilizer to a potting mix that you're starting seeds indoors with because the microbial life is not there to necessarily break down now if it's if it's water soluble uh, granular fertilizer then, then you're okay on that Right. Um, so another one is the grow lights. How do you time them? Do you turn them on off at night, back on in the morning? Um, well, our happy leaf, they are set up on a timer. They go on at it's about 10 a.m. and go off at about 10 p.m. Yeah, 12 and 12. Uh, that's a good standard um, uh, frame there. And, that yeah, we use the happy leaf LED, and, and you can certainly find that on the website, the com. They do have a coupon code available if you're interested in purchasing uh, on that. So, uh, let's see here. Oh, we got um, we got a, a compliment. Uh, Charlie from New York said he got his Happy Leaf Grow Light, 17-inch. Um, He's going to make a stand for it. Um, and he was excited to get the, the Happy Leaf. We just talked about that just now. The discount. Mm-hmm. Uh, when is the right time to plant carrots in container gardening? Uh, and you referenced using a cardboard covering uh can you help me out and explain that in more detail well the the ideal time to plant carrots in the ground or containers is when the soil is between 55 and 70 degrees now we're going to reference this cardboard covering or you can use lumber to cover when you plant carrot seeds carrot seeds are extremely tiny so they require a minimal amount of soil over top of the seed so if you just broadcast the seed and plant the carrot and put a little soil over top of it, the seeds are going to dry out very, very quickly. So what you can do is moisten the soil in which you're planting in, plant the seed, cover it lightly with more moist soil or compost, and then cover it with cardboard. Or you can take a, a board, a 2x4, a 2x6, a 1x8, whatever, and you're covering the seed and the soil and creating a very tight Con, uh, connection with all with the soil and the the seed, and it doesn't allow the water to evaporate or the moisture to evaporate out of the soil. So you're holding everything together, and the seeds will take seven to fourteen days to germinate. Once those seeds begin to germinate, you'll lift the cardboard up or the board, and you will see it. And then you can remove the board and or the cardboard, and it'll be fine. But what you're doing is you're holding that moisture next to the seed to allow the seed to uh, 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 absorb it to germinate. This is going to increase your seed germination by 80, even 90%. So that's what we're referencing on that when it comes to the seeds of the carrots. Uh, And you can do this in containers or raised beds. Let's go to the IV Organics uh, hotline. Caller, you are on the air. What is, you have a question or comment? Well, good morning, sir, and good morning to your wife as well. Good morning, Mr. Devo. Good morning, Milwaukee. Um, There seems to be a um, somewhat of a a deal with the uh, current uh, uh, breakout on lettuce here with the E. coli and all that. But th- th- does it necessarily have to come from uh, bird poop then necessarily? Or, you know, because you got rabbits, foxes, uh, raccoons, you know, uh, possums going through 
you know, fields and gardens and things. So, I mean, the, the, um, would, would a necessary outbreak like that necessarily have to come from actual bird waste then? Um, and and I'll, I'll listen to you over the air then because, you know, and, and, and you know, what, what, what can we do to prevent such breakouts like that when it comes to lettuce? And why is it always the the back end because it seems like we always get it on the back end like you know um you know some some 50 plus people have gotten sick you know after it's gone to market already right so so why are we always you know dealing with the breakout like this you know i know you know i love gardening but i mean you know th- there has to be you know the food drug administration or you know someone you know what why is it always uh you know um why, why why isn't it more preventative as opposed to reactionary you know i mean you know <laughs> here we are we got to get sick from it before they can find out what the what the, the root cause absolutely. is absolutely and i'll listen to you over the air thank you i love your show thank, thank you, you. Thank you for calling. Yes. All right, Holly, you want to address that one? So the preventative part is because they've already they've already shipped that lettuce out, and it's already on the store shelves, and the people are going to get sick before they start to add it up. That this is this is what happened. Um, that your food travels fifteen hundred miles approximately on average, yeah. on average from farm to to table. So if so, think about that. If that lettuce was produced in California, by the time it gets here, it's on the store shelf. You take it home, you buy it, you eat it. And then it is contaminated. All of a sudden, that that's why, because it's not like a, a direct point of sale. Like if you go to a farmer's market, it's been shipped pretty far. And, and, at and that point, it's not so much the birds or the raccoons or the deer. This is, the reason why that salmonella or E. coli is because that's from livestock, right? Okay. That's the, the that's runoff. Manure, the yeah, runoff. The runoff. Yeah. So if a, if a bird on your lettuce in your garden, you should be okay if you see that on your lettuce and you just want to don't eat that part. Um, if a, a raccoon's running through your lettuce, just always rinse your lettuce. But for the most part, you don't have to really worry about that from your, your home garden. If you are, for some reason, concerned about that, you could always plant in raised beds or containers and keep it above the ground. Yeah, and, the, and the problem is with the farm, it wasn't being properly maintained, and that's where that runoff comes that, from. That's another thing is it's cross-contamination. It's yeah. like, like, you know, when you use your cutting boards at home, you don't want to use your chicken cutting board with your... Vegetable cutting board. Right. Yeah. So that's where that has come. Good so question. So on large agricultural, yeah. they have to be more mindful of how they're they're um, combining things. Yeah, and especially when it's like lettuce, and it's different if it's less like soybeans or corn, and it's for grain use. But with this actual veg, you know, getting shipped, that's the big problem with this. I would say that if to prevent this going forward, you could probably buy organic lettuce. I think that's a little bit safer, generally. Right. There, yeah. So, good question. We appreciate that very much, so, and uh, I think we've at least addressed it to the point where it uh, makes some sense there. Uh, we, we addressed the tomato question, or the, the carrot question. Uh, let's see here. Number 35. Okay, so I've been watching the show on Netflix um, filmed in the UK. They use this plant called comfrey in their compost bin. They also make a comfrey mash. Um, it's it fertilizes the plants. It speeds up the composting. Do we can we grow comfrey in Wisconsin? Um, and do we have a native plant in Wisconsin that does the same thing as comfrey? So I did some research on this. I can't find a native plant that does the same thing as comfrey. Comfrey is a very nutrient rich plant yeah. for your. You can make teas out of it to to feed your plants. You can put it in your compost pile. A lot of NPK and a lot of micronutrients. Right. So it's a it's a very um, nutrient dense plant, right? So what you can do is you can grow it though. And the nice thing about comfrey is that it's a perennial, which means that it's going to come back year after year. So even though it's not native, it was brought to the United States by people from the UK, and that's how it ended up here. Um, it's not native, but you can grow it, and it'll come back year after year. And it is cold hardy. It's cold tolerant. Um, it's not going to grow during the winter after frost, but it will it will come back. And you would want to grow it from crowns or from root cuttings. Growing it from seed is a little bit difficult. So that, that's that. Well, when we come back, our good friend and our guest, Joe Carson, will be with us talking about straw bale gardening right after this. Use Twitter to reach Joey and Holly at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG. 
Eco Garden Systems is a revolutionary way to grow food, a fully contained raised platform with a conventional watering system, solar power unit optional. Made from recycled material in the U.S., Eco Garden Systems Raised Garden Bed offers sustainable, organic gardening that is environmentally sound, quick and easy to set up, maintain, and fun to use. Fill your garden with soil and plant your seeds. Your Eco Garden will take care of the rest. Can set up in backyard, patio, and even your driveway, any level surface. For more information, visit EcoGardenSystems.com. Use coupon code WIVEG125 to save $125 and get free shipping. A $250 value on the purchase of an Eco Garden original garden unit available only in stone color. Purchases must be made to the website EcoGardenSystems.com forward slash store. Offer valid through December 31st, 2018. Available to the contiguous United States. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice. The health food stores hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Lost Tools wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Haas Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at RebelGreen.com. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses, find out more at FlameEngineering.com. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. I know you're looking for an alternative to harsh chemicals, but you want professional strength products. BioSafe's Garden Line gives you just that. Professionally used for 20 years, available to homeowners. Organic solutions that are effective. They offer an array of eco-friendly products from plant food, fertilizer, to one-of-a-kind herbicides, organic weed killer. BioSafe's products can be used around children, pets, wildlife, so you can enjoy your yard more. Grow stronger, healthier with BioSafe. Find us on Facebook at BioSafe home and garden and visit us at biosafe.net to learn more get 10 percent off your next purchase at biosafe.net by using coupon code twvg at checkout the number one key to healthy productive plants are the roots starting from seed to full-grown plants rootmaker.com has the answer from seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots creating a fabulous root system Never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center has been around since 1955, and they've gotten several awards because of you, the listener, and you, the patrons of Blue Mills. 
Right. They've made the A list um, for best garden um, center and best landscape center um, in 2017. And they won that award because of people like us and people like you voting for them and supporting them. And there was a number of different uh, garden centers that was involved in that in the category there. Blue Mills won it again. Uh, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center is the place. Uh, they've been around playing in the dirt since 1955. Family owned and operated. They're, the owner of the business works in the building. So unlike a lot of companies. Uh, you can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. Uh, they can supply and surpass all of your garden needs. Bluemails.com is the location. You can also call them at 414-282-4220. They're open now weekdays, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, I believe it is. And they have over 40 uh, different types of bulk and material. And um, just south of Loomis Road, or just south of, did, did you give the address? Yeah, yeah I gave okay. the address, yeah. So let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Apparently, uh, we missed rehearsal this morning. And bring in our next guest, Holly. All right, so we have uh, Joel Carson. He is from Minnesota. He's the author of the Straw Bell Garden. Um, he came up, he's the inventor of the Straw Bell Garden method, and he's also the author of a few different Straw Bell Garden books at this point. And he teaches this all throughout the world, this method and how to, to use it. Welcome to the program, Joel. Good morning. Good sunny Saturday morning to you. Well, I, I guess it is in Minnesota it might be sunny. In, in oh. Milwaukee it's a little different story. Hey, huh? but there's no snow coming out of the sky, so That's let's right. be happy for that. We got 12 inches a, a week ago Saturday, so That's we got 12 inches. So. Well, at some point we're going to get in the garden, Joel, and uh, yeah. your your concept or your development of the straw bale garden method, uh, how did this concept begin? Where was that like, hey, I think this might work? Well, like like most things, it's the necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I grew up on a dairy farm in southwest Minnesota, and when I was a kid, we'd always have a broken bale that would end up tossed against the barn, and six months would go by, and I would notice, even as a little kid, I would notice great big tall thistles would grow out of those decomposing bales, and then, you know, Dad would come by with the manure spreader, and it was my job to take a pitchfork and throw those nasty old, decomposed bales on the manure spreader and I would notice what they turned into after sitting there for six months or a year. And so now we fast forward about 15 years and I, I graduate from the University of Minnesota. I did get a degree in, in horticulture and then I buy my first house. Well, it turns out the house I bought only had one inch of topsoil and being a poor college student who had just graduated from college and had student loans and I just bought a house. So I was broke and I didn't have money to build raised beds which is what a normal gardener would do, of course. Instead, I thought to myself, you know, I could get some bales, just like used to lay by the barn, and if they grow thistles so well, they should grow tomatoes and peppers just as well. So I did some experimenting, and the first year we tried it, I had some great success doing it. And over the last, over the then following, it's now been 26 years since I did that first garden, um, over the next 26 years, I sort of perfected the method to make it really foolproof uh, for anybody to be able to do it in any climate using, doesn't have to necessarily be straw. I know it says straw bale gardening as the method, but we have people that use hay bales, that use um, compressed bales of sugar cane stalks. You know, depending on where you're at in the world, you may not have oat straw or wheat straw available, but really any compressed organic material will work for this method of gardening. So it doesn't necessarily have to be what we're familiar with as straw. Um, and, it, and the method is now spread all over the world. So it definitely works and solves a lot of problems. That's the big thing. What it, a lot of people will see the straw bale gardening method or they'll read something about it online on some random blog post and they don't read your book, they don't reference your your great information. What is the biggest mistake people make for those for these people who fall into that that trap well, of sorts? That's a good question, Holly. And I'll tell you, the first thing that's really important for your listeners to understand, for everybody to understand about straw bale gardening, and I I, I say this at the beginning of my talks, and it really gets a a quick response: is nothing really grows in straw. It's important to know that you you need to first decompose the straw. Because things grow really well once that straw has begun to decompose. But if you just started with fresh a fresh bale of straw and tried to plant into it, you'd have very poor results. You need to spend the first two weeks what we call conditioning the bale. And that process is really where we're feeding 
bacteria inside that bale. Now, the unfortunate thing is you can't see them because they're so small. But we're going to feed these bacteria what they like to eat. And what bacteria like to eat is nitrogen. Now, that can be in the form of an organic source of nitrogen, like blood meal or something else that has nitrogen, or it can be just lawn fertilizer if you're a traditional gardener. Uh, so you're going to throw lawn fertilizer in there, and you give it a little moisture, a little bit of water, and that fires up those bacteria. And the bacteria very quickly will colonize. They'll reproduce. They'll colonize the entire bale. And then those bacteria begin to metabolize the straw. And they break the cells of the straw that make up the stalks of that straw or whatever organic material you're breaking down. And it eats up those cells and turns those cells back into molecules and breaks those molecules back into the ions that created those molecules. So now inside this bale, you have available ions of things you would recognize. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, molybdenum, zinc, calcium, iron, manganese, all of these little nutrients that we talk about that plants need to absorb in order to grow healthy plants. So now these ions are available. They can be taken in through the roots of your new tomato plant or whatever it is you, you planted into that bale. So you have to get the bale conditioned before you can plant in there. Now, if you're just driving by someone's house and you saw some straw bales sitting out there and a couple weeks later they had tomatoes planted and a couple weeks later they had great big tall tomatoes they were harvesting, you might think to yourself, well, I'll just get a bale of straw and I'll just plant something right in it. And you would very quickly nosedive. You would not have very much success at all. Um, doing that. So that's the biggest mistake people make is they anticipate that they can just buy a bale of straw and just plant something in it and it's going to grow fine. And it really doesn't work. You first have to go through the conditioning process. Well, that's important. Well, I want to make reference to, to people who may be listening to the program who really are not farmers or don't even know what a straw bale is. What, what are we talking about the size of a bale? It's what, about three foot long by about 18 inches high? Is that about what we're looking at the yep, dimensions? Okay. That's pretty average. You know, if you get out west, they got what we call three strainers. They got big bales out there. They'll be 48 inches long, and they'll be 20 inches tall or 22 inches tall if you set them up on edge. And they got three strings going around them. So they're great big bales. But the method that I give you in terms of how much nitrogen to use will really work from a pretty small bale to a to a pretty good size bale. Now, if you get to the great big square bales that the farmers make these days or you get to the big round bales, you're going to have to scale up how much nitrogen you use in order to get those conditioned based on how much that bale weighs. You know, if it weighs 20 times as much as a small bale, you'd have to scale up that much. Well, um, but we... you can use big round bales. I, I, right. As a matter of fact, there's a woman from Wisconsin who, who has a YouTube video about how you can cut a big round bale in half and use that for straw bale garden. So it does work. Well, when we do the straw bale garden correctly, when we condition the bale correctly and we get the plants growing correctly, as the book indicates, do we have to worry about bugs, diseases, or is that one of these things that we have to worry about that no matter what method we're, we're practicing? Well, I'll tell you what, flying insects you're never going to get away from because your squash bugs, you know, you're still going to get the butterflies that, or the little moths that fly in. So those are, are difficult to, to fight those. You use the same traditional methods of preventing those and as you would in a regular garden. But the one thing that we do have a big advantage on with straw bale gardening is remember that inside this bale is becoming new soil. So it's virgin soil you're working with inside the bale. You're never using last year's soil that you gardened in. So if there's any insect or disease problems that are harboring in the soil, you don't have to deal with those from one year to the next. Um, eventually a, a soil-borne insect will find its way up into the bale and it will eventually find the root of the plant. But that will take at least a season before you're going to have to deal with those same soil-borne problems. The big one is disease problems. You know, if you have if you have tomato blight in your tomatoes, that blight tends to be spores that are stuck on the leaves of the tomato. Now, the tomato leaves fall off. They get tilled into your soil or worked into your soil. And then next year, you plant a tomato in the same area, and those spores on those leaves are still in that soil. Along comes the rain and splashes that spore up onto the leaves of that new tomato plant, and now the disease is back again, whether that's septoria or, you know, verticillium wilt. or There's lots of tomato diseases that we fight, and they're al almost always universally they're transmitted from spores that come from your existing soil. So what the garden center will tell you is, well, just go to the other side of the yard and plant your tomatoes over there. But the problem with that is if you walk in the other part of the, of the garden with your shoes, 
you're going to pick up spores on your shoes, and then you're going to transfer them to the new garden spot, and eventually you're going to get the disease in that spot as well. So it's real easy to transport those spores from one to the other, where if you put down bales, now you're 20 inches above the ground when you plant your tomatoes, so you're not going to have to deal with those spores. So for those of us who are doing it correctly and those maybe who want to do straw bale gardening, what is one or two of the benefits that absolutely stand out above the rest? Well, biggest one in our climate up here where we're up north is that the bales get warm. And, you know, it's hard to explain why. I could go into the biology of why, but really it's all these dividing bacteria inside there. And as they divide, they, they vibrate. That vibration dissipates as heat. And that heat causes your bales during this decomposition, this, this conditioning period, causes them to get really hot. Uh, right now, if you look on Facebook, there's people all over the country that are conditioning their bales, and the popular picture is they'll stick their thermometer in their bales, and they'll take a picture of it because they can't believe their bales are 130 degrees inside or 125 degrees. And so it's an amazing concept that that happens, but it does. Now your bales cool off a little bit after the two weeks of conditioning, but they still might be 100 degrees when you plant that tomato in there. Well, now a tomato is growing in a 100-degree bale of straw, instead of 45 or 50 degree soil. That's a huge advantage. It allows faster root production. You'll see roots will penetrate deep into that bale. Uh, when your seeds germinate, the, the roots are looking for that heat down below in the bale, so very quickly they'll establish roots. And getting large root systems established early is, of course, really important for vegetable plants because it allows them to take up more nutrients later in the season, allows a larger reservoir of moisture uh, for those plants. So that, the fact that those bales get warm really is a distinguishing thing, and it's really important the further north you get. You know, it's, it's still an advantage if you're in Texas and you're planting a garden because they can plant a little earlier there, just like we plant a little earlier up here if we're using straw bales versus the soil. So they get a little bit of an advantage as well. But the further north you get, I have people way up in the Ar- above the Arctic Circle, believe it or not, in Alaska and Norway, they just love this method because they don't have to wait for the soil to warm up. They can plant. As soon as the weather gets nice enough, they can get their plants in the, in the, in the bales so, because of that warmth. So that's a really big advantage. The fact that you don't have to bend over is a big one. You know, there's a lot of people out there with physical limitations that can't get down to the ground. So that's a really big one. That's an obvious one, but, you know, people who use chairs, wheelchairs to get around, is a great way for them to be able to garden. People who just like to put a lawn chair next to the bale and be able to plant and harvest while in a seated position, you know, it really allows access for a lot more people. And the biggest one of all is there's no weeds. You know, we think about vegetable gardening. Along with the vegetable gardening comes lots of weeding, lots of effort throughout the summer. And with the straw bale garden, you'll get very few, if any, weeds. You might get a couple sprouts of oats or wheat that left over that might come out of your bale. You pluck those out and make a, I tell people to take all those wheat sprouts and make a wheatgrass smoothie. (laughs) And that'll be your first crop of the season. Uh, but after that, you really don't get any more weeds at all. You'll go the whole summer and you won't have to pull any weeds. Now, this is not me saying it. You know, if you look on our, we have 110,000 followers on our Facebook page that all do this, and they'll tell you, you read in the fall especially, you'll see lots of comments where people say, oh, my goodness, I should have been doing this for the last 30 years. I started straw bale gardening, and now I haven't had to pull weeds all year. So right. That's great. Um, so real quick, where can we find the book? Um, I'm sure most large retailers, but where can we find What's the easiest way for us to find the book? Well, you can go to our website. That's the best way, strawbellgardens.com, and then you'll get an autographed copy from me, especially. So you can go there, or, of course, you know, anywhere, basically, anywhere books are sold, you can find it. It's a super popular book, so um, almost everybody that sells books sells copies. Well, Joel, we greatly appreciate you taking time and sharing your information with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners to, uh, about straw bale gardening and the benefits that it can have for our backyard and our health. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, you guys, and have a great gardening season if I don't talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Joel. And we'll be right back after this with your garden question. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVOrganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Wouldn't you love to get more from your growing space? By utilizing the square foot garden method and properly spacing your plants, Seeding Square will optimize and organize your veggie garden to grow more greens and less weeds. The square foot 
color-coded seed spacer is a great tool for any garden, ground, container, or raised bed, and all experience levels, even little green thumbs. For more information, visit SeedingSquare.com. Seeding Square is gardening made simple. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvests. For more information and to purchase, visit Plant Success Organics. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg front. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code WISCONVEG to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Here at Outpost Natural Foods, it's not just that we're community-owned that sets us apart. It's the fabulous foods we sell. We celebrate Earth Day every day by offering our customers the finest natural and organic food selections in greater Milwaukee. Outpost local farmers and vendors provide our stores with a delicious selection of fresh, seasonal produce that you won't want to miss. Outpost stores are located in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, Bayview, and Mequon. We're a real Milwaukee original where anyone can shop and anyone can join. For the whole scoop about Outpost, we invite you to visit www.outpost.coop. Woodman's is a Wisconsin-based family-owned company founded in 1919. They offer low prices in every single aisle every day. No need to carry a discount card. From produce to meat to international to natural and organic, all offered at the lowest possible prices. Over 60,000 products at every store. Service and savings every day. They're employee-owned to help you save money. They also offer online shopping for pickup and delivery, working to save you more money. Visit woodmans-food.com to find the nearest location. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Dike, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oil, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. We had a question um, come in. They want to know, can you grow eggplant in containers? You absolutely can grow eggplant in containers. It's actually beneficial to grow eggplant in containers because eggplants love a lot of heat in the roots. As long as you can keep moisture to it and put the heat to the roots, eggplants will do great. So you want a container that's about 10 or 12 inches deep, drainage holes obviously, uh, as well as a minimum capacity of 5 gallons. So you could even do a 5-gallon bucket, preferably if you can get a black 5-gallon bucket or paint it black to absorb that heat and drill some holes in in the uh, bottom portion of it to get the plants to drain properly. Uh, Eggplants will do phenomenal in uh, container gardens. Today has just been filled with questions, and we love that when you ask us questions because we want to help you 
grow a garden. We may be a little slow on a couple of days getting an answer to you, but we want to get you the right answer. And some questions are more in-depth than other questions are. And we want to make sure we get that to you. So you can always email us at twvgshow at gmail.com at any time or just go to the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and click on the question button. And we can always help you with that. A question uh, was, uh, I went recently was at one of your straw, uh, the straw, uh, tomato garden talks, and I was wanting to know if I could use milk to pour around the plant to, to add calcium to the soil. Will that work? Yes, it will work. Um, there are gardeners uh, that will do that if their milk has gone spoil or has gone bad. They will also use that method if they're going to go on vacation. They've got some milk left in the fridge and they're going to be gone for a week. They'll pour it around the plants. You want to pour it around the plants and, and add a little water and make sure you get that milk in the soil so you don't have rodents or cats or other animals coming in and digging that up because of that smell. But that will add a certain level of calcium to your uh, tomatoes, to your other vegetation, your other uh, edible plants as well. Let's see here. Greetings from the still frosty Winnipeg, Canada. Well, it's still frosty here in Milwaukee, but uh, I have a question. I'm trying to start some seeds indoors. I am planting using those cheap, tiny uh, peat pots uh, to start in, the, the little uh, Dixie cup-sized ones. How, can, uh, how long can a plant survive before I need to uh, repot it or it gets root-bound? Uh, my end date to put plants in the ground uh, here in, Can uh, in Canada is the Canadian holiday. Um, I guess that would be May, May Long Day weekend, which is uh, around the 18th of May here in the States. Uh, what is your suggestions? Well, when we try to start seeds, the, the peat pots are good if it's a temporary deal. The peat pots are that peat moss that is formed into a small pot or some are larger. You can get these at your garden center with plants already in them. They wick water away from the soil very quickly. Uh, so you want to have a lot of soil mass inside that container. I would recommend something that would be the size of a party cup, a 9 or 16 ounce, 9, 12, 16 ounce area. So you have a lot of soil in if you have the space. And if you want to go with the peat pot, that's fine. The, when you plant the seed in the garden, you want to remove that peat pot, essentially remove the whole thing and plant that root ball in the soil because the peat pot doesn't break down uh, over the growing season as it is suggest suggested it is supposed to. It can take a year or two and you're re restricting the roots. So you want to do a much larger container or if you just want to do in root maker trays or party cups, just make sure you water adequately and don't overwater. Some people are watering, uh, we get emails, some people are watering their tomatoes and their peppers and their eggplants daily, and that's far too much water. You want to water when the soil is dry or almost dry. You can kind of see that the soil pull away from the container itself uh, as it's drying away. It just naturally pulls away from the, the walls of the party cup, the, 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 the cell that you planted in, and you want to catch it right before it does that. You just don't want to overwater it because a lot of problems can persist when uh, that occurs. What is the largest and juiciest carrot uh, I can plant? Well, that uh, is up for debate. Uh, this is from J uh, Jane. Uh, there's a list of great seeds uh, from uh, carrot seeds on migardener.com. They are being sold out. He, uh, MI Gardener is restocking them as quickly as possible. But uh, I, I don't have a specific one that I like more than others. If you've had a fresh carrot that you've pulled out of the garden, it is the most juiciest carrot you've ever had. You don't get that juicy level, that fla flavor level as you would at the grocery store. You can get it, mimic it si slightly from the, the farmer's market, but it's not the same, but just any carrot grown out of the garden, you're going to have a very good, juicy carrot. We are out of time, and we appreciate yours. We always enjoy you joining us each Saturday morning. Join us next week. Programming note, we're going to discuss the importance of bringing birds into your garden and how to do it correctly, as well as perennial edible plants, which you might want to set up, such as a food forest, that the plants will grow for you and you have to put minimal to no effort into it, as well as author of com Composting for a New Generation, Michelle Belize will be with us as well as your garden questions. 
Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab at the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Miss any portion or want to revisit it or look for a specific interview or a certain topic from Season 1 or Season 2, you can find that under the Highlight tab on the main page of the website. For Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and until next week, we will see you in the garden. You've been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.